This is Guilty Conscience. Casual discussions on transfer pricing, tax treaties, and related topics. A podcast from Skadden that invites thought leaders and industry experts to discuss pressing transfer pricing issues, international tax reform efforts, and tax administration trends. We also dig into the innovative approaches companies are using to navigate the international tax environment and address the obligation everyone loves to hate. Now your hosts, Skadden Partners David Farhat and Nate Carter. Hello all, welcome back to Guilty Conscience. As usual, you're joined by Iman Kyler, Stefan Victor, Nate Carton, and myself, David Farhat. We have a very interesting one today. Um, we typically talk about transfer pricing and international tax issues, and today we actually have some international folks joining us to talk about a very interesting issue. Um, the German non, non-resident IP withholding tax. This is a bit of a controversial one. This is one some of you may be dealing with, and it's a old new rule. So before we jump in, I'm going to allow um, our guests to introduce themselves. Can I turn it over to you, Ryan? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, David, and uh, uh, happy to be here and, and talk about talk with everyone today. Uh, my name is Ryan Lang. I'm a director in the Transfer Pricing Group at Kroll, and I am located in Chicago. So very happy to be here. I'll turn it over to Welcome, Karen. Ryan. Thank you. Yeah, same for me. Thanks a lot for inviting us. A pleasure to join. I'm Karen Kisser, an MD in the transfer pricing evaluation practice of Kroll, located in the Munich office. And I'll give over to Johannes. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Johannes Frey. I am tax partner in the Frankfurt office of Skadden, and I'm very happy to be here. Thanks all for joining. So, Johannes, let me kick. Let me start with you. You've written an article on this, and it's like I said, it's a bit controversial. Can you give us a little bit of background on this tax and why it may be causing some folks so many problems? Absolutely. So, this is a tax which is very old. It was actually implemented already in 1925 and has been um, amended in 1934, and it has never been applied. Um, with respect to taxpayers which are not resident in Germany. So that is a tax which the authorities think would apply if two taxpayers outside of Germany would license IP which is registered in Germany. And all of a sudden in 2020, there were articles in the press out and the authorities were not um, really um, knowing what to do about that. And there was actually also the uh, discussion to abolish it, but in the end, it was not abolished, but was applied. So that's in a nutshell where we stand now. How did it sit dormant for all these years and then all of a sudden come back to life? Is it something people just weren't paying attention to or is it a new interpretation or something else? Um, that's me guessing. I would think that... Um, the authorities and everybody, although the courts thought that there is no enough nexus, not enough link between the German authorities or the German uh, jurisdiction and the respective license between two non-Germans. So usually the concept would have been or was that only a license where a licensor or a licensee is in Germany would be subject to German tax. And naturally, you would not tax um, a transaction where there is no linkage to Germany whatsoever, other than part of the part of the rights which are granted are registered in Germany. So for folks out there who are new to this, maybe let's give them an example. If you have a U.S. multinational company that licenses its IP to its operating headquarters in some other country, not Germany, Ireland, Switzerland, whatever, the idea is that to the extent that the royalties relate to German registered rights, Germany would assert the ability to withhold even though they're not on either side of the transaction. That's exactly right, Nate. That's exactly right. And um, one additional problem here is that this came all of a sudden out of the blue. And uh, the authorities now try to analyze all cases since 2013. And nobody thought in 2013, nobody thought about that, obviously, because n nobody applied this rule. So that's another angle which makes it much more complex.
So one obvious question is, how do they know? Exactly. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good question. I think it's, it's almost impossible to investigate the facts. It's also impossible to have a, 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 a coherent strategy for the authorities to treat all taxpayers equally. Right. So it's, it's very difficult to find a system which treats them in a way that you say, okay, these are the taxpayers which are under investigations all since 2013 uh, without uh, treating um, certain multinationals different from other multinationals. Yeah. And Ryan and Karim, if I could throw it to you guys for a second, how does um, Germany then value this IP? How do we determine what exactly that the tax is based on? David, that's a question where we don't have, let's say, a definite answer. We have some ideas, and there is a circular out there from the Minister of Finance uh, explaining at least their their expectations of that, and maybe ruling out some of the uh, options. But but it, overall, it caught us a surprise as well, since you know this is a classical area where we economists work with lawyers. They tell us they need the value or price, and we we do the pricing and the value. And and here it was the question, but what are the value, right? That's really like economy. So we talked a lot with lawyers saying, what is this, right? And um, so the, the, there is there is a circular out from the Ministry of Finance, um, which rules out to say, well, if it's since it's tied to registration in Germany, they don't want to see just the registration cost as a proportion of value, and that will be subject to this tax. They rather think of this should be something of a, let's say, income-based approach where whatever is paid for such registered IP, that will be subject to in a, in a very high level. And we can dive deeper if you want, but that's mm -hmm. that's that's where they come from. There's a payment for an IP that is registered in Germany, and that payment we want to fix space. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about how the tax authority determines who owes the tax. That's cloudy. We talk about how to determine the tax. That's a bit cloudy. And I'll ask the last question. If I'm a taxpayer, how do I know that I'm subject to this? Is that more certain? Or am I just living with this risk? I think you have to live with that risk. It's not certain at all. Because usually how these uh, IP agreements work are that they cover all rights, all worldwide mm -hmm. rights for a certain topic. So they would not distinguish between Germany, France, China, Korea. And then in a possible scenario, you have actually a Chinese company entering into an agreement with an Indonesian company. And they conceptually, they could cover German IP, but they would never need German IP. So under the agreement, if you read the agreement literally, you could say, arguably, there is German IP included. But how should an Indonesian uh, company use German IP if it has not even a German branch or German subsidiary? So um, it's very cloudy here as well. And that makes so, it almost inapplicable. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's walk through that scenario you just described. How we, I see how you describe it, that there would be risk for this company now that have signed the agreement between Indonesia and China that has IP that's registered in Germany. How would then... Germany tax that, or how would they have a German tax liability? So can we just walk through some of those mechanics as to how, you know, the German tax authority would then reach in to, to tax this or the situation where they could have some risk there? Absolutely. So one possibility is that uh, the Indonesian or the Chinese company actually notifies the German authorities, then they would know, right? Mm -hmm. Another alternative would be that the German authorities would actually look into the German register and check whether there is an Indonesian company which has a registered right in Germany and investigate vis-a-vis -vis such Indonesian or Chinese company. But there are millions of companies uh, which, are, which have registered rights in Germany, so it would an almost impossible task to, to do this, in my view. I'm not an IP lawyer, but I think it's, it's almost impossible. But if you don't do this, on the other hand, if the authorities don't do that and just focus on the 
on the companies which actually disclose something. They don't uh, treat everybody equally, obviously. And um, actually, there is also case law with respect to interest income in the early um, 2000s where the Constitutional Court held that if you cannot really enforce a tax law equally, then this tax law is con uh, not constitutional. It, it violates the equal treatment. And that's, in my view, a very strong argument. And uh, mm -hmm. in my view, it's very difficult for the authorities to to reject this in a way that they say, okay, no, we, we treat everybody equally. I think it's almost impossible. And so would that be the strongest challenge um, that one could present that it's almost impossible on either scenario to treat all taxpayers equally? Or is it, you know, the fact that this law that's been on the books for so long hasn't been applied until recently, um, or that there's even a difficulty in determining the tax. There's so many ways that this is cloudy. So is that the, is that the strongest argument? I think it is actually. And there is also a different uh, angle to this unequal treatment. If, uh, if you were, let's say, a Chinese company and you did an IP transaction in 2014, you would not have expected that a German tax comes up, right? because nobody applied it so far. Whereas a, a German entity would have known this, right? And would have been able to structure in a way, still efficient without being abusive in a way that the German tax would not apply. Though this, uh, I would call it retrospective application is by itself also quite critical and um, uh, could be challenged based on unequal treatment as well. And that's actually even more true within the EU, right? I mean, we are, here in a country which is basically subject also to the EU freedoms. And interestingly enough, and Germany was very pushy on this, Germany pushed that the EU freedoms are the same as the German um, basic rights. So you could make the same argument under EU law, and EU law clearly prevails over German law. And you're absolutely right, Stefan, that would be this equal, unequal treatment would one of the, of the strongest arguments. So where does it stand? Is anybody going to court on this? I would expect that in the near future, um, companies would go to court. And in a way, a court uh, proceeding would uh, lead to the opportunity that the this respective German court could ask the European Court of Justice to, to uh, review that, which would also be very interesting because under EU law, you cannot, uh, you can definitely not discriminate, but you can also not limit certain things like the freedom of capital. That would be clearly an infringement of the freedom of capital as well, if you have a capital transaction and that will be taxed. So that would be one possibility how this whole uh, case could be solved. At the same time, the um, Federal Finance Ministry requested a report, which is due by the end of June of this year, in order to see where the status quo is. And possibly the um, Federal Finance Ministry would then um, uh, take the view that this uh, rule needs to be abolished, also in light, possibly with respect to Pillar 1, and we, come, we may come to this later on. Um, but it would, it, uh, to answer your question, I think it would go to court because um, it's, it's so clearly illegal that uh, taxpayers mm -hmm. would not accept an easy settlement here. That's my expectation. I know it's early in this process, meaning this just came up, say, in 2020, but is there any indication of um, types of companies they're targeting or types of transactions? Because to your point, I mean, looking backwards to 2013 and trying to capture all of this is yeah. a near impossible task. Um, yeah. Is there any indication of types of multinational that they're focusing on? Huh? And right, I think that's a very good question because uh, for, uh, for applying an equal treatment, you need to have a certain concept. And I don't see this concept that you target certain types of companies or uh, target certain transactions. There could be a coherent system to target, to say, for example, okay, we, we just look at certain patterns or we don't look at software, etc. these kind of things. But 
to put it that way, I don't see a certain concept or a certain strategy. I think it appears a little bit that the the um, the companies who basically come up and and notify the authorities, those are the companies which will be investigated against. So let me let me ask this question, kind of uh, to before we get into talking about deviating from you know norms and what we've seen. So if I'm a tax director, I've got a comp uh, uh, a multinational that has operations in Germany, but I have IP that I'm using completely outside of Germany that's registered in Germany. And I come to you, Johannes Karim, and I say, listen, I'm concerned about this rule. What should I be doing? What should I be looking at? Because I don't want to be hit with an adjustment in Germany that I have to now deal with or an audit that I have to now deal with because I'm licensing IP that has absolutely nothing to do with Germany, outside of Germany, but it's registered in Germany. So what's the kind of practical, what are the practical considerations for me as a tax director? Uh, it seems to be just as quiet as a church mouse. <laughs> <laughs> That's the advice. <laughs> And yeah, David, to your question, I mean, this discussion obviously has come up a lot of times in um, in 2020, and usually a good approach is to go with the herd to do what, what, what others do, right? Yeah. Um, and usually the approach would be to disclose the facts which are relevant, which you consider relevant, but at the same time explain, going to your example, to explain the authorities that these IP rights were not used in Germany, though they have no value for Germany, so Germany cannot tax them. I think that's quite critical. At the same time, it would make sense, and then I would hand over to Karim to basically have a robust strategy with respect to the quantification. That's equally important. And we haven't discussed this so far. Um, if, it, if taxpayer A buys a property from taxpayer B, the, author the authorities are required to determine both the soil and the building explicitly. So if that is true, it's also true if there is an IP agreement with, I don't know, 1,000 rights, and the authorities need to determine every single right in order to establish the, 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 the tax action. That, that's quite, quite important. And what I mean by that is um, they basically just make estimations, right? Which in, in my view is not permitted because you simply first have to investigate as much as you, as much, much as possible before the, before the authorities could, in, could, could basically estimate. But at the same time, as a tax director, you want to have a robust quantification, mm -hmm. which shows the amounts which could conceivably in a worst case scenario be attributable to Germany. Karim, and I think that is basically then where you would come into play. Yeah. Yeah. So, Karim, please walk walk us through that because I I hear Johannes, and I'm like, this rule is ridiculous. It it, it sounds illegal, but I'm not going to litigation tomorrow. I want to deal with my tax tax risk now. So, yeah. what are we doing to kind of value this? What are we doing to say, even if we say, okay, we're going to pay some de minimis amount so sure. that we don't we don't get into trouble. What am I doing at this point? Yeah, so so this is I mean this is exactly the point where we came into play, right? So we're learning about this legislation and understand trying to understand really what is it, right? What what we want to price and, and and you know there was not much guidance at the beginning, not not you know not even for lawyers, right? There was saying, yeah. this is legislation. Can you can you please do us a value? And we're like, what what is it? And so we had lots of discussion around that point and we figured well the the law says you know, an income or like an income stream that is connected to that registered IP. So you know, then, then you start figuring out what that what does that mean? I don't know, with your example, either a license payment for country A to country B or a disposal of IP from country A to country B. Usually that's a huge bundle. That is not just what's happening in 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 Germany. And here comes another element. Usually when we from evaluation, the transfer pricing perspective, price or value things, we're looking for value. We're looking for market price. We're not looking for just splitting numbers, which this exercise at the beginning sounded like 
it is to be right saying this is there there is a, there is some transaction there's a price for that transaction now i want the piece that's connected to to a german registered ip but is it the value or not that's not really answered and so and and therefore we had to adapt to this a bit um and there is not a clear view whether there should be a value waste pricing or there shouldn't be a value waste pricing. so and if there shouldn't be well then we start saying this is a price there's a license payment there's a bundle of of ip know-how some sometimes services embedded in there and we really break that down we really break that down to say there is a proportion of that that's really just connected to the registered ip that would be one approach but it doesn't answer the question is that supposed to be part of a german ID? obviously it isn't otherwise we would have a transfer pricing issue as well so so it just says there is some connection but it's not answering the question of value and if you go the next step Johannes, you, you you tell me whether legally there is an opening for that. Um, if you say, well, maybe transfer pricing principles can be adopted or valuation principles can be adopted. And there is a lot of opinions out there that that might be the case. But then we're saying what value has the registration in itself? And that's that where it becomes really interesting to say what value is the registration in Germany for as a proportion of that income stream? And then that's what I tried to mention earlier. Some say, well, the registration is just a, a process. You go through it, you register it, there's no cost, you pay a few lawyers, and, and then you're done. Right? So if you, again, adopt some transfer pricing model to it, some say that's really just a service and give it a cost plus and believe it. That would be the, the extreme opinion. As I believe some mm -hmm. companies went that way, um, which may be right or wrong, but the Finance Ministry has clearly said that's not what we want to accept. It's not binding for us, right, Johannes? You correct me. Yeah, not binding for to us, but that's going to be their uh, assessment in an audit center. So that would be, and let's say, if you want to be a, a, a company that, that goes smooth through an audit without assessing it's right or wrong, that would be an extreme scenario and probably not accepted in an, in an audit, even though you may be right. And and Kieran, maybe just a, something we talked about as we were preparing for this is just the, the overall concept that the law assumes that there's value there, right? It, it's sort of taking a revenue stream and attributing a portion of the revenue stream to the registration versus actually <clears throat> economically evaluating if there's value. And maybe a, a concrete example of that is something else we talked about where if you have a German registered patent and an EU registered patent, there's some duplicative nature there. And so <clears throat> as an economist looking at that and saying, if you're getting the same protection from an EU registration than you are from a German registration, does the German registration have any value, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, it could be, it, so it, it's making the assumption it, that there is value there. And I think that's ultimately one of the questions is, are you just assigning a portion of an income stream or are you really asking us to determine value? Because in some circumstances, the value could be zero. Um, yeah, absolutely right, right. So, so that that makes it difficult, right? From a value perspective, if you adopt those kind of concepts, we would say, well, there are alternatives. So, if you if you if you know that this is costing you money because of a withholding tax, and you have alternatives, you go with the alternatives. But I think even there, the there are statements from. The tax authorities or Ministry of Finance saying even if it's registered European wide, we still consider that mm -hmm. as German registration. So it, it just shows that they're really moving away from a value based analysis there. But having said that, still in the circular they're published, they're they're suggesting or so they're not ruling out any type of apportionment that goes into that direction because they're saying they they um defined what I just mentioned as a, just looking at the costs as a bottom-up approach. Let's, let's take it as a definition, whether it's the right term or not, but that's what they're using. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, we don't really accept that. We want to have a top-down approach. So they're starting really with the income stream and then saying, we want to have a logic to break that down to the registered IP. And um, if you break it down, we had some cases where we came up with the same value. So doing both, right? Well, independently, and that this is something you know, some companies do as 
really trying to do the right thing and not being in trouble, they say, well, let's just calculate both ways and see where we end. And then we can, you know, um, um, uh, propose to the tax authorities we've, we've been diligent. Um, so, so you may come up with the same same answer, and depends, of course, on the industry. But, but what the top-down approach then means is saying, we'll start with the payment. And the payment may be a bundle of, of IP, know-how, management services, um, and then we'll break it down. Right? We'll break it down and say, what, what proportion of that is actually just Germany? Mm-hmm. And what proportion of that revenue is just the registered IP carving out of, you know, other items mm-hmm. of uh, the, that impact the license. Um, and then you come to, you, you still have a value that is attached to, or a price that is attached to a value creation. It's still the IP value of that registered IP. Now, for TP principles, we would say if you want to have that, you know, you, you, you usually under, try to understand who's created that IP, who has mm-hmm. rights to it. Um, and that's what we call the, the DEMPI analysis um, in the OECD framework. So maybe taking one step further, if we're all to apply that DEMPI analysis, then the registration itself is, again, only the protection. And I'm saying only protection can be routine, can be valuable, right? So, um, and, and if we're saying it's just the, the act of protection, we're again with the cost plus approach saying, well, it's just the cost analysis. If we're saying, but what value does the option provide of a country giving you the right to protect IP? That's, you know, maybe something slightly higher, right? That's something you could, you could adopt as at least some kind of logic to it, uh, but maybe to the link. This, this goes somehow into another discussion which other countries use as what we call, or what they call lo- location-specific savings. So it's kind of like a right to protect IP, and we want to know the price or value for that you're generating, and we want to take that. So it, it sounds to me a lot like like that concept we heard from the emerging countries. So Karim, if I can interrupt you here quickly, this brings me to one of my favorite topics in transfer pricing. It's double tax and competent authority. Listening to what you and Johannes and Ryan have kind of walked through, it seems like you could have several different jurisdictions claiming the same value from that income stream, right? You could have Germany kind of stepping on, if we use the example with uh, China and Indonesia, could be stepping on someone else's rights or taking a portion that some other jurisdiction believes it's theirs. Um, Is competent authority an option here? Do you think whether it's doing it on the front end with some kind of APA or on the back end after you end up with controversy in in some map procedure? Do you think that makes sense for this issue? If I jump first, I I don't know, Danish. (laughs) I don't know because it really goes, in my opinion, it goes somehow back to what do they try to tax? Are they trying to tax profits? Then, then we are kind of like in a value-based analogy, and I think it's a double taxation. And I will show it because I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but if they just say, uh, there's an income stream, there's a price, I, I want to have a withholding tax on it. I, I'm not sure whether there, there is a double tax, they are taxing it. So, but mm-hmm. I stop here because I'm not a lawyer. Johannes has probably much better ideas on this than I have. <laughs> Yeah, so I would I would think that a double taxation occurs in many instances actually, especially if you have a license, and the royalties are actually um, based on the on the on the gross amount. So there is no deduction possible, and at the same time, so this would, would be a tax on the licensee, but at the same time, it would be a tax on the licensor in the licensor's jurisdiction. So that would be, in my view, a clear double taxation and uh, would also be uh, not a net taxation, right? Because the authorities would actually uh, take uh, the, the gross amount. They would, not, uh, they would not allow deductions, which is actually against EU law, but they don't care in these circumstances. But I would think a map would be a very intuitive um, tool to uh, protect the respective taxpayers here because it's clearly a double taxation. Given that, do you think Germany will focus its resources on situations where the royalty is being paid to a non-treaty country? That could be true, 
if it's a non-treaty country, then it would be it would be tricky. But then I guess even if it's a non-treaty country or a non-treaty protected uh, entity, apart from MAP, there would still be EU law, for example, which protects this non-treaty protected entity, by the way. That's also an interesting angle to that. Listening to all this, I hear there's a lot of uncertainty as to application. Johannes thinks it might be unconstitutional. Karim and Ryan say that it's impossibly hard to value and you have this range of possible outcomes. It's very difficult, other than through affirmative disclosure, for the tax authorities to really understand what's going on because it's typically a payment outside of the German system. So if I'm somebody out there who ordinarily thinks, yeah, I want to follow the herd, I listen to this and I'm thinking, here it sounds like the herd is marching toward the lions. What happens to me <laughs> if I don't do this and I just wait for others to let their cases percolate through? Am I putting myself at greater risk? And I guess to add on to that, what is the bigger risk or how can a company what um what are the larger chances that a company is going to be surprised is it that there is any tax liability at all or is it the amount that they'll have to pay i would usually think that um i mean it depends on the specific facts but you would usually want to disclose because you have a variety of different risks if you if you don't disclose in time you would also have an interest risk. You would have uh, another other liability risk. You would have potentially also corporate risk. So you would you were usually kind of forced also under compliance law to, and also which is also recommendable to to disclose to go with the herd. Okay, you go you go um, basically to to use your picture to the lions. Yeah, you 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 narrow come to narrow to the lions but on the other hand i mean there there would be somebody a hunter who basically protects you against the lions and that would be the european court of justice i would say <laughs> 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 so um you're not unprotected against the lions i would say uh, because the lions are also subject to to certain rules so clearly um this law seems to deviate from a lot of the international norm on this topic. But do you foresee other jurisdictions saying, if Germany could do this, we can too, and following this trend? Or do you think most jurisdictions are going to see the problems and not even take the risk to implement similar laws? And, and as an add-on, what are the reactions from other jurisdictions that you're seeing to this German rule? Right. Not sure, Johanna, but you have a view on this or an opinion? I have not heard of any reactions of, of other jurisdictions on, on, on this so far, but Nate can speak to this as, as well. Um, I, I would think that um, the EU would be very interested in this if it picks it up. I would also think that it's clearly uh, in violation of, of Pillar 1 because in essence... <laughs> It, it works like a DST, like a digital sales tax, because as Karim said, you basically look at the royalties uh, attributable to a certain market mm -hmm. jurisdiction, which is kind of similar to a digital sales tax. And that's exactly what should be abolished before pillar one comes should come into play. So at a certain point in time, I, I would assume that all jurisdictions would be interested in this kind of um, mm -hmm text. That's my expectation. And I think going back to the map point, this is why if I run into problems with this in Germany, I would really want to go to competent authority just to get the view from another jurisdiction. Yeah. Because if nothing else, just the kind of uncertainty and the difficulties we talked about, I think would make the other jurisdictions ears uh, perk up. Because you can, if nothing else, challenge on that, on the how do you value this and why should this value be assigned to Germany? And I think you get to a point and say, okay, maybe it's just a cost plus if we talk about the protection. But it, 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 it's certainly an, an interesting one, um, given how difficult it is to enforce, how difficult it is to prepare for it. And the, 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 the question I would have, are there kind of in 
is Germany enforcing this? Do we have situations where taxpayers are now kind of dealing with an audit around us? My experience on that is, I mean, the communication is clear. They're going to enforce it. That's at least you mm -hmm. know, in the circular. So there was there was a stage where we were expecting a circular, uh, which, which uh, gives ease to all this. But you know, the reverse happened, and they were clearly stating they're going to enforce this. And then the 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 guidance they published, which are binding for tax authorities, gives you also you know, outlines what do they do if a company doesn't provide enough information, doesn't look all the you know, numbers required, and doesn't cooperate, right? So, and, and then comes the right to basically estimate this, this um, amount, um, which, which basically only takes a payment made and, and allocates the German proportion just based on sales generated. So it's an it's an easy way, and that's kind of like in the in the documents in there. So so it, it gives enough power to tax authorities to not just enforce it, but also to estimate a value if companies are not cooperating. Which is of course a high hurdle to say, in my opinion, as long as you know there's meaningful work done and as we're doing with the client approach now is that we're creating different ways of valuing this this amount, uh, even if we're arguing strongly that one is better than the other, um, I think it's hard to say they're not cooperating, but at least there is their instruments in place. So and at the moment, the risk is there that they're enforcing, but of course, with all the legal options companies have to to uh, push back on that. To elaborate on what Karen mentioned, and, and probably to further a comment about the herding mentality, I know, you know, one of the most recent examples we had it, it was a, a company that probably didn't have a whole lot of risk in this area, but they qualified for the tax. They had German registered IP and they chose to file the file the, the exemptions. I mean, they were with the treaty country. They chose to file the exemptions, submit everything. And, and just because they didn't want to be in the line of fire uh, if and when something was to get enforced. And I think... <clears throat> For that, from that perspective, from a valuation standpoint, we were doing that when things were evolving um, before the the 2021 circular had come out. Uh, but still, we needed to put some sort of value associated with um, what the IP was valued at, and we we put forth the cost approach. And you know, I, I think you know, without the benefit of that guidance, I think that's a fairly principled standard approach to it to say. Hey, you know, this is a routine function and we're going to treat it as such. We're going to apply a method that shows that it's routine. And we did more, more than simply, you know, taking the registration cost and marking it up. There was a, a, a more robust effort to identify costs, but I think they wanted to put their stake in the ground and say, you know, we did all we had to do um, and sort of get out of that bucket of, of that line of fire to say we did it versus not doing anything. Um, they've at least put forth the effort and, um, Correct, yeah. I, you know, that, that, that's, that's at least one example of, yeah. of number one, the hurting mentality, but two, uh, sort of going against the grain in terms of using a method that clearly isn't preferred by the taxing authority. Right. That was before we knew that the category doesn't, don't allow the cost approach, although that there are variations of that. So they just mentioned cost approach, but I think they are, the, the, the assumption is it's only the registration. When we talked about the cost approach, it's of course also the protection costs in there. So, so it's much more than than just the registration. The treaty angle is an interesting one because for those that have been following the issue for a while, it's I think fairly clear that if you're in a treaty country, you're better off. And I think the German tax authorities have been at multiple levels more flexible with royalty recipients that are in treaty countries. But maybe, Johannes, for those that are new to this issue, talk a little bit about how they've dealt with situations where ultimately, of course, people didn't realize that they were subject to the tax because the idea is brand new, even though the law has been around for 100 years. But if you were to apply it, it would be zero or a low withholding rate anyway. Yeah, and um, that's a, a bit unfortunate as well. Um, 
as you said, Nate, most most taxpayers applied for exemption certificates also uh, retrospectively, which is kind of new because usually you would apply uh, for the future. Um, and so far, uh, based on on my on our experience, we we haven't received any exemption certificates from the authorities after almost two years, even in crystal clear treaty cases. So um, one gets a little bit the impression that um, answers uh, lead to to new uh, to new questions. And also in t in terms of enforcement, it's it's uh, unfortunate that this enforcement is imminent because if I if if I put myself into the shoes of the authorities, I have here a, I have here a, a law which has never been applied in that way. All of a sudden, it comes up, and uh, I am supposed to apply it uh, retroactively since two thousand thirteen. I would have thought it would be wise to wait a little bit to see where things stand with all taxpayers, wait for the status report until June, and then decide what to do. Because once you enforce now, it's very difficult to say, okay, we abolish it now or not. It's, it's very, very tricky. And uh, it's extremely burdensome, not only for the, for the taxpayers, but equally for the authorities. And one thing is also clear, there is case law uh, in the EU out, which states that if, if a government applies um, law which uh, violates EU law, it, the government is liable as well. So it's not a one-way street. So I think it would have been more prudent to wait until this report has been finalized in order to get a better overview. I think it's also obviously, to go back to our first point, quite Quite un, quite unfair and an unequal treatment to to single out certain taxpayers based on criteria nobody knows and try to tax them, whereas others have not even disclosed anything. What's the problem on the exemption certificates? Is it that they are raising legitimate questions, or are the tax authorities just the dog that caught the car? Now all of a sudden they're overwhelmed by exemption certificate applications and they really don't know what to do with any of this because they weren't planning on enforcing it either. Yeah, I think they are maybe a little bit like like the dog you mentioned. Um, uh, they, they are overwhelmed and I think the taxpayers need to be sure that they don't fall into any certain fishing expeditions. I'm not saying that there mm -hmm. are fishing expeditions, but uh, I think every taxpayer needs to be careful that um, the taxpayer only responds to foreseeably relevant questions in this respect. So in other words, going back to our China-Indonesian um, transaction, I would have thought that a question which uh, requests information on all reorganizations since 2013 would not be relevant in relation to the German IP uh, question. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And if you are in this kind of um, in, in this kind of pattern, you would there come again questions, questions, answers, and questions. So it's a little bit of it's a little bit of a trap, I would say. I think we get to the point with a lot of this, and um, not to be flippant, but it's as we walk down the road, it's always I don't know. And and that's not how you want your tax rules to work, right? It's yeah, one of these exactly. things where the, where there's a lot of confusion. So as we we're, we're coming uh, to, to 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 the end of end of our time, just practically speaking, as taxpayers who may have operations in Germany or may use IP that's registered in Germany, kind of going back to an earlier question, what what is kind of the practical advice, right? On, from a valuation standpoint, and I, and I, and I love the examples, uh, Ryan, you walked through about you know the anecdotal. This is this is what we did, but what should I be doing, right? I know I have to stay with the herd. I know there there there, there are potential punishments if I just don't register, and that could be an easy gotcha. Um, what should I really be doing? Um, and to kind of walk through, follow the herd, do evaluation, even if it's not in, exactly in line. With, with, with what the tax authorities um, have put out. And if I'm in a treaty country, file for my exemption or look to map or maybe even early engagement with the competent authority at, at, an, at the level of APA. Is there anything else I should be thinking about is if I'm a cautious tax, tax director that doesn't want to end up in litigation? 
I think one point which is equally important is um, to be aware of these rules um, going forward. If you have now a reorganization which covers potentially German IP, and most transactions cover potentially German IP, um, then you want to be sure that those transactions are structured in a way that they don't qualify for a disposal or license mm -hmm. for German IP. Uh, that's an entirely possible without having an abusive structure or anything, because there are certain disposals which are not caught by these rules, which are, disp which are, for example, contributions without issuance of new shares. So there, there are clear ways how to structure it. And that's quite important to not to go into any trap if you have um, uh, future transactions. I think that's equally crucial. And Karim Ryan, from a valuation standpoint? Yeah, so, so my view on this is really coming out of some discussions with clients, narrows down to one approach that most of them end up following it. If you are already in this situation that you are subject to this law, so we're talking about pre being able to restructure things, well, then then in order not to be at too much risk, you, you file your position. And what we do is usually we run different analysis. So we we don't want to be just do an extreme case where we already know that the tax authorities are not in favor. And they're not even like in a, because it's binding to them, they, they won't be able to accept it. So, so mm -hmm. we'll, we'll actually follow that. But of course, we do it diligent way and, and see how far is really the amount tied to the, the, the German registered IP. Right? And sometimes it's actually not as much as we thought. Sometimes it depends on the industry. Sometimes it's a lot. So, but, but do that, make your case and worst case, you have to go to court. I mean, it's just, you know, sometimes the rules are like that. You have to fight for your yeah. right, first case. But at least you have a substantial good case in your hand. Mm -hmm. You can happily defend and someone has to go that and again, and someone will. Yeah, I think from my perspective, I, I may have mentioned it before, I, I fall back on taking a principled approach and whatever position you take, I think reasonable and defensible. And so... Yeah, to the extent you can assess your risk under the different methods, you know, there's always this this give and take of resources and time and money to to getting perfect information. But take the approach where you kind of figure out your bookends, take a reasonable approach that you can put your best foot forward and it's defensible. And if you're if you're you know applying sound economic principles, um, I think in the end it should win the day. And and I think about it, you know, this is a German issue. We have these bigger tax landscape changes that are occurring. And you know, we talked about pillar one and other things like how will, what do you ultimately fall back on as maybe things, are, the, these levers are shifting. Um, yeah. Maybe keep that in the back of your head. And like I said, I fall back on principles and a reasonable approach. I, I may actually also just, just circle back because I didn't want to end up with the core policy. That's the final word of me. <laughs> so, so of, of course, the hope is that in all this scenario, if we have good arguments, we can solve them, mm -hmm. right? And and quite often we do in other cases. So why shouldn't we be successful here as well? As long as everyone said we have a reasonable position. And you mentioned, you know, if the map option is available, then of course we'll, we'll choose that form. So, so don't don't let me close down on the third <laughs> option. <laughs> That's never the preferred option. <laughs> So we need, uh, we need to solve the earlier. You do want to be someplace where you can start the conversation yourself with your own method and not leave it to the exactly. tax authorities to start Absolutely. there. So it, as yeah. much as I would like to be the lone water buffalo wandering myself, I, I get the follow the herd strategy. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. And this goes back to the point Reluctant to we admit made, it. You know, I never want to follow the herd. And yes, but, anyone, but says Nate, follow, we've, anyone says we've follow all the seen herd, the nature I shows. wander away. The one buffalo away from the herd is the one that doesn't make it to the end of the migration story. That's just the that's that's just the one they film. I'm sure there's <laughs> buffalo everywhere that are doing great, living lives of of solitude and peace. <laughs> 
<laughs> so the advice hey, is thanks don't everybody get filmed for joining. being away from the fact. <laughs> the fact. <laughs> no, it, indeed, Nate. Precisely. Thanks everyone for joining. This has been great. And to our guests, thank you so much for coming on. We hope to have another session and talk to you guys again. As usual, thanks this is uh, thank you. Guilty Conscience. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks for thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of Guilty Conscience. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss any future conversations. Skadden's tax team is recognized globally for providing clients with creative and innovative solutions to their most pressing transactional, planning, and controversy challenges. Additional information about Skadden can be found at skadden.com. 